So what I will talk about today is objectivist ethics as presented by objectivists and anything I might think about that I will leave for later. Uh, and uh, when preparing this presentation I watched the uh, I watched the recording of the version of this uh, program that we did in 2021 uh, in the middle of the pandemic back then. Uh, that was fun. Uh, and the recording of that talk had like two hours, uh, so I decided to cut it down to the essentials. So we will cover the, 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 the core of the, of the objectivist approach to ethics and anything that, that might be left or anything you might be interested in in particular, we can cover uh, in the discussion afterwards or, or, or in two weeks. Uh, so that so that the recording is not that excessively long and people actually watch it. Uh, so objectivist ethics, uh, I asked Mid Journey to generate me an objectivist superhero, and uh, this is this is the cover picture I got. So oi, uh, and now you can't see. So we got Ayn Rand as a Statue of Liberty holding money, crashing buildings. Uh, so. I would say that pretty much well represents maybe the, the pop culture uh, uh, imagination of what objectivism is like and what we will cover today is, is whether this actually fits or, or not. Uh, so more specifically, we will cover, uh, we will go question by question uh, and we will build up on the, on the, on the, on the objectivist uh, theory in the sphere of ethics. So we will cover in the first place what ethics even is. Uh, and then we will cover the questions that, that will lead up to the complete whole, which is why we talk about life as a value, what it means for something to be a standard of value, and what follows from there. And in the end, we will discuss uh, how do other people uh, fit into this, uh, which will be sort of an opening to the presentation that we will have in a week. Uh, you know, we, we will actually have a real native speaker speaking English here to you. Uh, that will be Angel Angel Volko Worth uh, from the Objective Standard Institute, who will be talking about politics. Uh, so, uh, what is ethics? Uh, there will also be very bad memes throughout. So, if you if you are familiar with the series Good Place, uh, that could be viewed as a fun way to get some basic introduction to ethics in general. So it's a musical that I will mention later on. Uh, so in the two sections, or the two sessions that we already had, we covered metaphysics and epistemology of theory. Uh, and when we talk about metaphysics, we ask about the question of, of what is. Uh, in epistemology, we ask the question, how do we know what is? And in ethics today, we will be asking the question, uh, now that we know what is and how we know it, or that we know what is, uh, what do we do about it, uh, or what should we do about it? Uh, so ethics, as a as a field of knowledge, is uh, the attempt to discover or or identify the set of values that should that should guide our choices as individuals. Uh, and uh, so the answer to the question of what we should be doing. And there are already some some some. Uh, some prerequisites hidden in the in the question. So first of all, uh, we need to be existing in some reality. So that's already a presupposition that we need to have from the field of metaphysics. Uh, there need to be a consciousness that is making the choices. And since we are talking about choices, uh, uh, we also need to suppose the option of free choice. Uh, because if we do not have free choice, then we can't talk about ethics. We do not, if we do not make choices, then, then uh, that negates any, any idea of values that we could have. Uh, so what are values? Uh, values are something that we uh, aspire to, 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 to gain or keep. Uh, so in a sense, it is a goal. It is the goal of our action. And uh, there is a particular uh, way that we will be talking about values here. Uh, we will be mostly talking about uh, objective principles, and I think both the word objective and the word principle require some classification before we delve deeper. So when we talk about principles, we will be talking about uh, general rules of action. So 
we will not be talking about whether I should become a doctor or a teacher. Uh, we will be talking about whether uh, there is a principle of, of, of productive labor that I should be engaged in. Uh, whether initiation of force is, is bad or, or right. Uh, these are the kind of questions that we will cover, the general principles uh, for which we will attempt to try to find objective answers, which I will explain in a moment. And, and then uh, it is up to all of us to, to apply these principles in the context of our lives. And that fits into the, into the question of what objective here means. Uh, so uh, when we talked before uh, in the previous sessions about metaphysics, we talked about objective reality, we talked about ways to identify that reality. That seems, there the term objective seems, I hope, pretty straightforward. Uh, with ethics, it sometimes is more confusing, and that's partly because there is a different usage of terms applied in different sciences. Uh, so let's cover that briefly. So when we talk, uh, or when when we generally hear the word uh, object, or let me first try with some other other theories uh, that that we talk about. So what's typically understood by objective? Uh, is something that we here will call intrinsic theory of value. Uh, and that is one when the value of an action is, is uh, solely in the rule that the action represents. So the action itself has moral value regardless of who and when and where does it. So that would be, for example, the, uh, uh, the rule that lying is always wrong regardless of circumstances. Lying always has negative moral value. Uh, the value of the action is in the action itself. So that would be, that would be where only the action matters and, and not, the, not the context. So that would be the intrinsic theory of value, which is sometimes called objective. Uh, then there could be the subjective theory of value, uh, uh, which would be one where the, only the context matters. So the value is in the, uh, the value is in the, in the after, the time and the place, not really the action itself. So that would be the, and that's in a sense is a, is a negation of ethics because it's a negation of an aspiration at universality because it says that there is some fundamental difference between different actors and what is right for me is not, is not right for you. Uh, uh, just by the nature of me being you, you being you. Being you. Uh, sorry, me being, you, me being me and you being you. So that is the typical, most typical uh, uh, way in which we encounter this. Or uh, there is the collectivist version of that uh, uh, that you can find, for example, in Marx. Um, uh, and it very much is connected with, with epistemology that we discussed last time, uh, where what is wrong for some classes of society is 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 not the same for other classes, right? So so uh, you can't or you can't even conceive of what is right for the other class of society uh, because you belong to a different class. That is something that, for example, also Mises criticizes very well in Human Action in the in the chapter Polylogism, where he where he talks about how how, how Marxists use this sort of in a in a sense as a as not a completely honest line of defense of the of the of the Marxist theory, where they say, well, you can't really understand it because you come into this as an intellectual and as a non-worker, you can't understand this. Uh, or different standard applies to you because you are not a worker. So, so what is right for the worker would not be right for you because you are in a different position. So, uh, so because you are a different category of an individual. So, uh, belong to a different group. So, the subjectivist theory again is uh, only context matters, not the action. Uh, and the objectivist one that we are going to be talking uh, uh, that we are going to be talking about here is a combination of those so we look at both the action and the context so we have some general principles uh, that we that we try to discover and we apply them in specific context so uh, 
that's the that's the combination of both. So, for example, the example of flying, we will return to that later. Uh, so, uh, of course, it depends what the what the situation is for us to decide. So, if you are being forced by somebody uh, to 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 uh, to you know to reveal some information, then it might be completely. Uh, completely moral for you to lie, whereas in a normal situation like uh, when making a contract, it would not be right for you because uh, there is a context to your action in the in the in the moment, and we try to discover general principles in different in in uh, tied to their context. So that is what we are going to be talking about here when we talk about uh, when we talk about the objective theory of value. I have one more bad joke about that, uh, which is this one, uh, because uh, Kant is one of the, uh, the favorite examples, uh, very often mentioned whenever Engbrand writes about uh, the, the intrinsic theory of value, uh, where, uh, where, the, where the action itself has more value regardless of context. So one of the famous examples that Kant uses is specifically the lying one, that's why I used it. Uh, here's the example. The, I think the essay is called on the supposed right of, uh, of people to lie out of love, I think is the full name of the essay. And, uh, and uh, there he talks about that you can't even lie to, to a murderer who shows up in your house and ask where your friend is that he wants to murder. Uh, and it's a joke on that. that Kant would be very bad at playing poker because lying and like misguiding people in any circumstances is wrong. Uh, so that would be maybe a clear-cut example of where the theory sort of, uh, when applied consistently, the, interest, uh, the intrinsic theory of value runs into problems. And I don't have a similar example for the subjectivist theory of value because I think that uh, it's clear how that negates the idea of any general principles. Uh, although, uh, one more point of clarification on that is that when we talk about subjective theory of value in a different field in economics, uh, we mean something different by that. Uh, and I will return to that later on uh, at the end when we have discussed the, the, uh, the, the objectivist ethics, but, uh, but the, uh, the, the, subjective, the subjective theory of value as understood in economics is not in contradiction with the objectivist. Uh, ethical theory, because it's a different field, we have we place different requirements on it. We are discussing economic value, not not moral value here, uh, in, in economics. So why do we talk about life as a as a value when we talk about objectivist ethics? So we discussed before that a value is something that we act to gain or preserve, and in order to act, we need to be alive. That's very trivial, uh, trivial. Uh, information and uh, as people we have some nature, uh, some identity and we do not live automatically, we do not survive automatically, we don't have any automatic means of survival either so in any action that we take there is uh, there is uh, the underlying choice uh, whether we choose to, to support our life or not uh, and the idea is that uh, this is the basic choice and this is something that all our subsequent choices are, are reducible to and we need to, we need to generate some, some activity in order to stay alive. Uh, so I think this is pretty trivial but are there any questions about it before we move on to and before we build up on that, on that, on that piece of information? No? Alright. So, what is a standard of value and how does uh, life as a value fit into that? So, when we talk about the standard of value, uh, we talk about, uh, again, uh, an individual's life because, as we said, that is something that all the choices are, are reducible to. Uh, uh, at any given time, I can choose when I'm on a desert island uh, I can choose whether I will do nothing, whether I will just lay on a beach, or whether I will try
try to build a shelter, uh, build some net to hunt fish or something like that. Uh, so, and even in an advanced society, uh, you can you can you can generally classify choices on whether they support one's life or they do not. And uh, as such, uh, the 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 underlying choice of whether to choose to support one's life or not becomes the standard by which we judge uh, our actions because that is the one choice that, that all the other choices are reducible to. Uh, when we uh, when we uh, talk about uh, the when we talk about the human life uh, we don't only mean life as a as a as prolonging one's existence and we don't only talk about you know achieving longevity or survival at any cost uh, but we also do have to recognize that because people have some nature uh, uh, we do have some tools that we are equipped with to to survive uh, based on what we uh, how we function as as as, as a species as an entity and uh, we do not have any automatic instinct that would suffice for us to, to survive to prosper. Uh, so the, but the tool that we have is reason that allows us, as we discussed the last week, to, to integrate uh, a more uh, a conceptual understanding of the world around us, and and that allows us to 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 to. To, to, to you know to deal with uh, with with reality and 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 thrive and therefore because we as people are distinct from other other species that we so far know of in the fact that we are being rational the the standard here that we that we apply to other choices is not just survival not just prolonging of life but it is the uh, the upholding of of one's life as a rational being uh, so, in a in a sense, if this is complicated, uh, and I'm not sure maybe if objectivists in the room will complain, but if if I wanted to summarize it very quickly, uh, and this is true of any, this is not true specifically of objectivism, this is true of any moral theory uh, that that follows just basic logic. Uh, you do not want contradictions in your system, right? So by any implicit, any any choice that you do, you implicitly choose between upholding your life or not, and the whole thing then is about just being consistent in your choices. So uh, what uh, we are trying to build up when we talk in the rest of the talk today, we are just trying to be consistent with the basic choice of being, uh, of trying to support our life as a rational being. So. So, in a sense, once you make the basic choice, uh, then, then, then the rest is just not being a hypocrite about uh, in your other choices. Uh, and a question that often comes up here is, what happens when you just don't make a choice? When you decide that that uh, that you don't want to support your life, is that is that wrong from the objectivist perspective, or is it just something that? It's not thought of. Uh, that's a question that often comes up, and um, the the answer to that would be that the fact that we talk about life as the standard of value doesn't change the fact that the uh, in the beginning we talked about life itself as a value, meaning something that we want to achieve or keep, and if for some outside reasons. Uh, some outside circumstances, life to us stops being valuable, then it's, I believe, on the, first, on the objectivist argument, perfectly valid to, uh, to make the choice to not, uh, not keep one's life any longer and, and be consistent with the choice and carry out the actions that, are, uh, that follow up from there. Uh, but uh, as long as one uh, does not make that choice, then one should be consistent with with, uh, with the standard of life. And if one is not, then then again one is not acting morally because uh, not, or not 
but because but but you can tell that the person is categorical morally because they are because they are inconsistent. Uh, so is that now clear why we use life as specifically uh, one's life as a rational being as a as a standard of value before we move on to what follows from there? No. Okay. Uh, there was a question before we even started about what the objectivist uh, solution to the is ought problem, uh, meaning uh, to anybody who is not familiar, uh, how do we get, because that's a problem that is commonly discussed in the mo across many different philosophies, how do we bridge the gap between what is and what we should do about it? Uh, uh, because, because what is is a positive statement. Uh, this is a chair. But uh, the normative statement, what I should do about it, is typically perceived as something very different. As in, okay, this is a chair, but how do I know that I should not throw it at people? Uh, or something like that. Uh, and I would say the objectivist answer to that is that they would, uh, I would not say that they would dispute that there is a gap, but they would say that uh, the, the ought is implied in the X that any, any fact of reality implies uh, what I should do about it. Because me, I am myself a fact of reality, I exist in the world, I'm part of it, I have certain nature, the entities around me have certain nature, and in my nature and theirs, uh, and the context we find ourselves in, is, is implied uh, uh, what, what the ought for me there is. Uh, so, uh, and that follows from the fact that I am trying to uh, to discover what the what the rules of my conduct, what the what the moral thing for me to do is from uh, from the fact of my nature. So, since I try to do that, they would say that the, that the, an end from the nature of the world. So, uh, so uh, the the Objectivist answer to that would be that the, the, the ought is just implied in the ex, that there is no real gap. Uh, okay, so what follows? Uh, and when we talk about what follows, uh, we will discuss what's typically called rational egoism or, or selfishness. Uh, I think, I'm not sure if Virgil was showing it before we started, but but you can definitely read more in the in the collection of essays called virtue or selfishness uh, especially the first one called objectivist ethics so uh, and this is uh, just maybe a very clear follow-up from what we discussed before since my life is my standard of value uh, by which i judge my actions what follows is that the moral actions for me to undertake are the actions where I am a primary beneficiary of these actions. Uh, so an action where I would, uh, that I would undertake it would hurt me and perhaps benefit somebody else would not be a moral action. An action that benefits me and through that also benefits somebody else or doesn't would be a moral action. Uh, so maybe a good understanding of this is by contrast. Uh, so what is very often discussed is uh, in, in, uh, in books written by objectivists is, is the standard of altruism, uh, which is that the standard of, of value is not my own life, but the, value of, uh, but the life of somebody else or uh, society as a whole or, some, or nation or something completely else. Uh, and, uh, what uh, is shown in, in all of that, uh, in all that writings, I think maybe the clearest and most accessible example of that is the, is the Fountainhead, uh, the, the novel, uh, is that, is that this, uh, this, these standards lead to inner contradictions. So if the, the standard of value by which I should judge my actions would be uh, the life of somebody else, then I would have to take actions that don't benefit me but benefit somebody else. But 
how would I know what benefits somebody else even since everybody else is also bound by the same standard and they are also trying to take actions that benefit somebody else uh, and and it becomes sort of a vicious circle tra everybody trying to make somebody else happy who also is trying to make somebody else happy and they can't really you know accept somebody's help because they would make them happy and somebody no so so that that just is internally contradictory and the idea is that all the other possible standard properties are true so we always come back to the to the to one's life as the standard of value whenever we try to venture out of it uh, there are some interesting uh, other comparisons that we could draw and maybe we will draw them in the in the subsequent discussions such as uh, more in-depth dive into into Kantian ethics or comparison with utilitarianism which I think is also interesting uh, or another standard that's that uh, that I find interesting is not uh, a utilitarianism Materialism of sorts, where you don't try to make the max U, where you don't try to maximize utility, however defined, but you do like uh, min min C when you try to minimize cruelty or, or harm. We can uh, we can dive into all of that afterwards. But but the objectivist principle is is rational egoism, where a person's life is their standard of value by which they judge their actions. Uh, now, what I cut out from the presentation here compared to last time, uh, especially because of the length of the of the last year's version of this or uh, the last iteration of this, are virtues. Uh, but very briefly, virtues are some uh, categories of action uh, that are uh, that uh, that are in accordance with the with the standard of one's life and that lead to. Uh, successful accomplishment of value and the following of which uh, leads to leads to happiness. Uh, we can discuss them later on again as part of the discussion. Uh, they are something that we already touched upon, such as productive work, rationality, uh, honesty, and, and many more that we could talk about. But uh, but the reason I am discussing them here that uh, the virtues such as these is. Uh, categories of action that uh, that are useful for me as a simplification in a sense. Uh, I know that these actions as general guiding principles are in accordance with the standard they help me achieve my goals, but they are not the goal themselves. They don't uh, I should not attempt my goal should not be to be to be to be virtuous. Uh, I am virtuous in order to achieve uh, a certain goal. Uh, and what then is the what then is the is the purpose of ethics? Uh, and this is something that comes somewhat back to to our social that uh, that we had in the in the meme in the beginning, uh, because same as Aristotle, uh, England ultimately comes to the conclusion that uh, that while the standard of of ethics is my life, the the, the purpose or the goal of ethics is it happens. And what is happiness? It's the uh, state of consciousness that proceeds from uh, long-term successful achievement of one goals or the state of non-contradictory joy. What that means is that uh, I, am, I feel joy about something uh, in a long-term sustainable way uh, and in a way that doesn't uh, clash with any other principles that would result in any uh, other uh, negative emotion. So I don't feel guilty about the joy I feel. Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't feel ashamed for uh, for for what I did uh, in in order to, to to achieve the thing that brings me joy. It's it's a it's a it's a state of non-contradictory joy. Uh, and the maybe trivial observation is. Uh, is that joy is what you feel, what ones feel when they accomplish their their values. When something is a value for me and I achieve it, um, I am I am happy about it. That's I think a trivial observation, um, but uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the thing 
I am happy about is more. I can my goal would be to you know to 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 steal as many bullets as possible. Uh, and if I succeed and I steal all your bullets here, uh, I can possibly feel joy about that. But that's not a criteria that tells me that that stealing your bullets is right. That is why happiness is uh, that we talk about is a, is a long-term non-contradictory joy because that's something I don't have to feel guilty about and, and so on. So uh, that maybe is a useful sidebar to, uh, to what, uh, how we understand emotions. Uh, I'm not sure if we discussed that in depth when we talked about epistemology, but, uh, but uh, important thing to note about emotions is that they are in a sense, a feedback mechanism on 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 my values, but they are not a tool of of cognition. Uh, so, whether I feel um, happy about something or not is not something that gives me uh, any information about about uh, like guiding information about reality on which alone I can draw conclusions. So, just doing whatever makes me happy. So the Hedonic state utilitarianism is it would probably lead to to very weird or undesirable outcomes because uh, because as we discussed uh, if just achieving my values makes me happy then then if my values are off then then what I do in order to be happy could could be very very wrong indeed uh, so. Uh, Emotions, the same as sensations like pain or pleasure, are uh, some indicators on how well my body is doing in a particular situation. Like if I jump into a fire, that's I feel pain. That's a signal that I uh, that I that something's probably not all right with my body. Same, similarly, emotions are a feedback mechanism on 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 how am I doing. In comparison to my to my values, and how in what sense are they a useful tool of introspection? Uh, well, uh, if I achieve something that I consider a value, and I feel guilty about it, or I feel uh, I feel embarrassed, or I feel maybe a surprising negative emotion in some way, well, that could be an indicator that. I hold the values that conflict. So if I know if I succeed somewhere and I, I feel ashamed because somebody else didn't succeed or for uh, whatever other reason, uh, that means that probably I hold different values that are that are in conflict, and I should try to I should try to uh, identify the conflict and, and resolve it. Uh, so. Uh, emotions in that sense are a useful tool that can help me reveal conflicts in 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 the in the values I hold. Uh, but they don't uh, they aren't a good guidance in 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 selecting the values. Uh, that can only be done uh, rationally when one thinks about the aesthetic of value and what is what follows or what is in accordance with with that. Uh, but Coming back to happiness as a as a result of of uh, long term successful non contradictory achievement of of one goals and values, uh, I think that is a very neat in a sense uh, conclusion that if you have the right values and you are successful in achieving them, that also leads to uh, sustainable happiness. Uh, so that in a sense. Uh, is an important distinction again from the Kantian ethics that we can discuss later. Uh, it's not just about observing moral rules because we we reason that they are so, uh, but uh, the uh, I observe uh, the moral rules because I use them so. But also my goal in doing so is that in the long term that's what makes me happy because that's what I want. Uh, Maybe before we move to other people, any questions about that? Or disagreement? So, okay, we can leave that up for later. So, uh, 
final section, what about other people? Uh, that is the one that feeds into what we will be discussing next time with Angel, uh, uh, when we talk about politics, because politics uh, is the field of what the right social order should be, uh, how should society be organized, and, and how, uh, how it should work. Uh, so this is something, as uh, until now, all that we discussed, I could apply myself on the desert island. I could, you know, I could act morally or not on a desert island. Ethics is uh, is an individual field. I can I can be moral even in an immoral society. Uh, that's some decisions that I make on my own. But then there are also decisions uh, that I make in 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 regards to other people. Uh, so that's sort of the bridge between ethics and politics. Uh, because then that tells me what social system I should want to live in. And uh, same as we discussed that the standard of my action is my own life, uh, that is a conclusion that we came for from the very things that make me a human being. In the sense that I am a, a mortal uh, uh, mortal being, mortal entity with capacity, uh, capacity, uh, capacity for, for rational thinking and, 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 and conscious uh, volitional decisions uh, uh, and, and that's what we, what we reasoned from and that gave us the conclusion. Uh, but the same thing applies universally to human beings. Uh, that, is the, that is why I mentioned in the beginning also that we talked about uh, universal principles, uh, and if uh, if the same thing applies to uh, to all human beings, if all human beings act in order to sustain their own lives, uh, then that uh, that make all of them their own ends in themselves, uh, uh, which again is somewhat Kantian phrase. Yeah, something that we can discuss later, but uh, what that uh, what that means is that in order to to get around my relationship with people, I should never interfere with their with their ability to pursue their own ends as long as they don't do the same thing to myself. And there is much that was written about that about about the. Uh, the trader versus the, the, the parasite principle and and how how since people need to survive through productive action uh, predating on somebody else's product is not a very sustainable solution universally or in the long term but I think if we uh, if we really delve into it the most convincing argument here is uh, for for not uh, initiating force against others is that if I imagine uh, that I say okay I'm initiating force in any way against somebody else so that could be I am beating somebody with a stick or I am I am taking something they produce like their wallet uh, then I can be saying one of two things well I can say well okay I taking your wallet and I can do that because that's morally right, and in, if I am saying that, then either it's similarly right for everybody else, because we are talking about universal principles here, and if everybody can steal everybody's wallet, that's uh, very clearly not in my interest, because that's not the kind of society that would that would be that would sustain my or anybody's life in the long term, and uh, alternatively, I can say. It's right for me that I can take your wallet, but it's not right for you. it's not right for you. But then that doesn't really follow from the fact that we reason from the very universal characteristics of human beings as entities. So that would be introducing some subjectivism into the equation uh, that that we already discussed is uh, is internally contradictory and doesn't really work. Or I could be saying, well. It's not right for me to do it, but I'm doing it anyway. But then the uh, then the sort of the, the the conclusion is in the in the in the argument. If I'm already 
say I'm doing something that's not right, that uh, first of all not uh, moral argument and it invites punishment again, so uh, admits it. So so then uh, again we come to the conclusion that initiation of force is, is not in accordance with the uh, with one's life as a static organ. Uh, so I think that's maybe a good way to to end this section uh, with the conclusion that initiation of force is not in accordance with the with the with the standard of one's life. And I think we could again discuss more such as uh, such as defense against initiation of force, partly in an organized systemic way. That's something that we will talk about when we talk about politics. Uh, or in the in the form of the right to self defense, uh, which is an individual approval of that, which again would be considered moral. Uh, but but I think we can again leave that for the for the discussion and leave that here with the universal the principle of uh, that that supports uh, non initiation of force against others. So that concludes the very brief uh, introduction to to objectivist ethics. Uh, as I said, there is more that we could discuss and I hope that we will now or in two weeks or maybe next week if we want to continue the discussion in a related topic on politics and before we return to that and we open the discussion, uh, two quick notes about what's next. I mentioned before that I recommend to you the series that I had some of the jokes from. Uh, one other thing. Uh, I will not recommend you the same books that Vijay already recommended, consider them recommended as well. I mentioned some of them when I was speaking, but another thing that you didn't probably hear yet is this musical. Uh, I speak about it everywhere I go. Uh, it's a musical that was recorded at the, by the students of University of Cambridge. Uh, it's called, if you can't read it, A Theory of Justice, the musical. And it is uh, a cooperation between uh, drama students and philosophy students and it is about the main hero of the musical is John Rawls if you are not familiar he is uh, generally considered the most famous political philosopher of the 20th century uh, and he is the father of one of the father or like the main figure of of liberalism in the American sense the, the progressive liberalism and of course, he is the main hero because that's uh, that's uh, that the atmosphere in which the musical was made of. But and there is uh, and the biggest villain of the musical is Ayn Rand. Uh, but uh, even though you might disagree with like, the conclusions that the musical draws, it's uh, the the text of the songs have uh, have direct quotations from the from the works. Of the of the philosophers, all of them, the, because I will not spoil too much. But in the plot, they travel through time and they meet different philosophers. It's interesting, to say the least. Uh, and uh, more importantly, uh, on this Saturday here in Prague, we have our students for the birthday conference. We do them annually, at least once a year. Uh, we still hope that this year we will actually do two, another one in Brno. But this one is talking about the capitalism of the future, and we will talk both about this field of ideas. Uh, we will be, uh, we will have Nikos from the Aaron Institute joining us, as well as Angel, who we will also hear after the conference here on Monday. Uh, she will uh, join us from the Objective Standard Institute, and we will be talking about both uh, the field of ideas and how we see it developing. And we will also be talking about practical solutions and what we expect the future might bring. We will cover some problems such as uh, poverty and charity and how capitalism might approach it or, or how these might not be such a big problems as they are perceived. Same as we are going to be talking about environmentalism and some other challenges that are typically discussed today. Uh, energy crisis, uh, you can just go to the website students for liberty cz.cz or if you speak Czech students zaslobodu.cz you will find the comments and all the details there. Registration is free, you will get nice t-shirts, you will get free dinner and you will hear many interesting thoughts. So we hope to see you there. And that really is all from me. So I am returning back here and if you have any questions, disagreements or anything you would like
like to discuss, I think we can start the informal section of this. Thank you.